Now, where did I put it? Hmm. Ah, here it is. Welcome to the Toolbox, where my guests and I discuss the tools they use every day to manage life, trauma, and everything. It may not be applicable right now, but it's another tool for your toolbox. And I hope you enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Tools for Toolbox. I am Chance Burles, as you know, and I have another outstanding guest. I can't wait to get started. So we're going to kick it off with the same question I always ask. Who are you? And tell me a little bit about your background. Well, Chance, thanks for having me. And I've probably been asking myself that question my whole life. So now you're going to force <laughs> me to answer it. <laughs> but, right. uh, <laughs> my, my, name, my name is Fran Richopi. I am the currently the host of the Jedberg podcast, which I started about a year and a half ago now. Um, I'm also the chief people officer at a company called Analytics Solutions, which is a, about an 800-person company uh, headquartered oh. out of Boston. Um, and then I work in performance development at Boston University, specifically with the men's rowing team. And uh, I was a Green Beret in the U.S. Army Special Forces for about 13 years before that. So not busy at all. Just <laughs> no. <laughs> a couple things here and there. No, you just got to change what you're doing. I, well, yeah. Too many times I look back and I'm like, well, I feel way busier now, but do I have the same impact? You know, that's what I think that's what matters you know, do, yeah. is can you can you wake up every day and think to your and, and look, you know, honestly at yourself and you know, not kind of you know, give yourself some fake perception of what you do, but, you know, honestly assess yourself and say, am I creating impact in what I'm doing? And, you know, for me, uh, if I can create impact in one person's life through the stories we're telling and the, the programs that we're trying to build, then I feel good when I go to sleep at night. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, it's amazingly fulfilling. Actually. I, I didn't think it was going to be as fulfilling as a, as I thought when I started podcasting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think I was 15 or 16 episodes in and somebody messaged me out of the blue from random, just being, Hey man, what you're doing is great. Keep it up. Yeah. And I was like, awesome <laughs> it's awesome. so motivating and, and and i like when those come at like the end of the day where you've had like the day where where you've had like no downloads right yep. and you yep. know because because you, you become obsessed you know and, and they tell bit, you yeah. don't get obsessed with that it's the long game it is and then some days you're like no no i think like we released this promo it was really good i worked like you know two hours i made i compiled that video i put b-roll in there i edited the sound i put music like it was sick and then you're like okay now it's going to correlate to downloads today right yeah. and then it doesn't you're like ah oh, okay well it's good it's going to be tomorrow and then you just sit yeah. there and you start telling yourself oh, okay i suck you know every conversation i have is terrible nobody wants to listen to me and then someone sends you the note you know and, yeah and it's like hey i you know you you inspired me to do something or i had i had a guy send me a note i, I don't remember his name off the top of my head but and it said, I, I used portions of a number of your episodes in my interviews. And I just, I got a job as an executive in a new company because I listened to your podcast. And I was like walking around showing it to people. I like, <laughs> see, yeah, I told I you, do, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> That's fantastic. So when did you, when did you get out of the military then? How long have I you been out. doing what you're doing now? Yeah, I got out in uh, 2016. So okay. January 2016, I'd uh, you know, kind of it still a bit over over you know, almost 13 years there, and I um, moved to New York. I had no idea what I was going to do with with myself. It was time to grow up. Um, time to figure out what the next chapter was going to be. I mm -hmm. was afforded a really awesome opportunity to go to work at Merrill Lynch as a financial advisor by a good friend of mine named Rick Nelson, mm -hmm. who brought me in as a, as a partner in his practice. And, um, you know, and I had, I said, I don't know anything about finance. Like I don't, I literally, I, I had applied, I'd applied to business school to, to yeah. go to NYU. And I had, I had gotten in because I was in interviews during my, when I was getting ready to get out mm -hmm. and I would, you, you go through this process where, you know, as a veteran, and especially you're conditioned in special operations to say that, well, I can do anything, you know, you just got to like, tell me, yeah. you know, tell me yeah. what you want me to do. And, you know, where do you want me to do it? And where's the research? I'll figure it out. And so you, you come out of the military and you very much have this attitude of, I'll do any job that you want me to do. I'll go anywhere that you want me to go do it, um, just give me a chance, right? Yeah. And then you yep. realize pretty quickly, like the rest of the world doesn't really work like that. 
you know, there's like few people in this world who are like, oh yeah, I know you know nothing about what we do, you know, we'll, but we'll hire you and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll figure it out. And then I came across this guy, Rick Nelson and, and Rick was really one of the first people. And now it's, since it's become you know, a motto of this podcast, I work with the talent war group. It's a big component of what we do and it's called mm-hmm. hire for character, train for skill. But it was one of the first times where that was really shown to me mm-hmm. where, where he said, my goal is to hire someone who has what, what he called a demonstrated history and pattern of success. And he yeah. said, I don't care that you don't know anything about finance. It, that doesn't matter, but what you've proven and what the army has done, you know, time and time again, is they've put you through a selection and a vetting process mm-hmm. and they've proven that you can be effective in a variety of different situations. And if I invest in you, the training and the time to develop you, I'm confident that I can be able to do that too. And, and that was one of the first times that I was really kind of shown to me that well, you can do a lot of things, but, but also at the same time, somebody does have to train you. And if they're not willing to do that, then you really can't go do anything at any place. Yeah. Uh, and so I went there. Yeah. I went there for a, a year and a half while I was at NYU and it was an awesome, awesome experience. But in the end, it wasn't, it, it, I didn't, it, 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 it was not my passion. And I had to go in one day and, and have the difficult conversation that I dreaded of, you know, I've, I love everything you've done and you're one of my best friends and always will be, but, uh, I gotta go. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's a really hard conversation to have. Um, oh, yeah. Especially, yeah. especially with yourself though, like, cause you have to sit there ahead of time going like, well, I mean, is it really, is it, is it, is it really that bad? Or do, 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 do I, can I, can I learn it a little bit more? Or is there more, something else I can do? And then eventually you get to a point where you're like, no, Shit, well, I never, no. fa- I never failed. Oh, for sure. You know, it was like really the first time and professionally, right? You know, I mean, yeah. like per, you know, personally, I you know, fail, fail all the time. You know, I think you, I mean, you do fail all the time, but but it was like the first time in my kind of professional career where where I was like, I, I I'm not good at this, mm-hmm. and I don't think I can do it, and I and I don't I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. And, you know, when you, you come into the army and, you know, my path had been, you know, go to basic training, go to officer candidate school, go to, go to ranger school, go to the infantry school, airborne, you, know, you go to all these things. And then I became a platoon leader and I went to Iraq and I became, and I went to selection for, for SF and I got selected and I went to 10th group and was a detachment commander and was a, a battalion assistant operations officer. I was the group assistant operations officer. I went to Africa. I went to, uh, you know, I went to Europe. I had, I was selected as a general's aide. You know, I'd been the honor graduate at, at every school, you know, all the, these schools. And then all of a sudden you get out. And it's like, I, 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 I can't do this. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have to come to this realization that like you, you, you're going to fail at this because you don't have, you're not invested. Right. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a skill thing. You know, like I passed the series seven, I passed all the tests. I, I was there. I, you know, I probably would have figured it out, but inside for the first time in my life, right. Where you have you have true autonomy. You know, I think people forget about yeah. that. You know, you, you know, in the military, you have autonomy, but like, you know, you, you generally end up on a career path that suits you, you know, and, and if you excel, you rare, you rarely end up somewhere where like, you're kind of like not supposed to be. Yeah. Um, and then you get out and now you realize, well, like, I don't, have to do this if I don't really want to, or if I'm not good at it, if it doesn't motivate me and that, and, and even though you see opportunity in doing other things, to me, there was still this very big sense of failure. Yeah. Yeah. That is a, uh, it's a very challenging thing. And I, I learned very early when I got out, never ask a veteran if he can do something because a hundred percent of the time they're going to go, yep. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I can do it you have to be a little bit more selective in how you speak to them. And you have to like, is this going to fit with the schedule or the timeline or whatever? Right. But the moment you add, add in can the hundred percent, the answer is going to be absolutely. I can't. Yeah. Once. <laughs> and then we'll see what happens <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but yeah, it's transitioning is such a, 
such a thing. And, you know, as you were saying earlier with skill can be trained, right? That's what the army does. Every single person that's ever been in the military knew nothing yeah. when they showed up. They got mm -hmm. taught how to tie their boots, how to clean their rifles, how to make their beds, how to blah, blah, blah. Everything's been taught. And then from there, people will rise to the top. Some won't. Like, it, it's just a, it's, I, I love the talent war group. That's with Mike Sorelli, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm, hopefully, I'll get him on the podcast one day. But uh, oh, I'll make the intro. I, I touch one time. That'd be it's awesome. Um, but I, I love the fact that it, the, the vision is changing overall. And I've seen it in cultural, a uh, bit of a cultural shift here in Canada is that there's a lot more understanding that anything can be taught. What you really want is the mindset to win, the mindset to advance, the mindset to develop rather than, you know, this thing is achievable. Cool. Go over there and do it. Right. It just feels better to me at least. <laughs> well, the vision can be, I mean, it can be, it can be taught, right. It, and organizations will be willing to take people in under that mindset if they're willing to put effort into number one, the talent acquisition process and making it a deliberate process, yeah. right? And number two, into the training process. Mm. And what happens is, and that's the very first step, right? Because a lot of organizations will say, okay, well, we want to, yeah, oh yes, definitely hire for character, train for skill. Definitely bring in the best person. We can teach him. We can teach him. Okay. Do you have a defined training program? Uh, what? <laughs> I mean, well, once this person shows up, right? Yeah. Okay. You've, you've hired the best person. Okay. We get it. Well, how are you going to train? Them? Mm -hmm. And then that's where you have, that's where you start running into failure. And then it starts getting put in the two hard box. Same for the talent acquisition process. Do you have a defined process where you've sat down, you've identified, this is the type of person I want. These are the core competencies they have to have. This is what they're going to do. And have you mapped capability, experience, right? Character mm -hmm. to what you're going to ask them to do every day, because that's what you have to define. If you've defined those things, then you have now what's a deliberate process to actually bring people in. But then how are you actually going to do that? Who's going to interview them? How are they going to interview them? How, what is the, what is the structure of these interviews? What are the question sets? Is everyone going to ask them the same questions? Who's on the panel? Do you have, you constructed the right panel? What's the feedback that you expect? Then are you going to train them when they get here? Mm -hmm. And those two things, although they brief well, are require thought and require investment from senior leaders to yeah. say, this is the process that we're going to go through. If you are in an organization that can commit to that and put resources behind that, then you can affect, be very effective in, hire, in hiring for character, training for skill. Too many times we start going down that road and it becomes, oh, I'm so, I'm, I have too many things to do. I can't think of, just put the job description out there, see who we get. And then you have the interview and it's like, okay, well, when am I going to do that interview? Oh, I'm going to do it in the 30 minutes between these two other meetings. Uh, yeah. And, but before that I have you know, four hours of meetings. And so I never looked at the person's resume. I never thought about the questions. I never had it. I never structured it in a way in which I'm deliberately going to approach the time that I have with this person to actually evaluate them and then what are we doing then we're just having a tangential conversation and then how yeah. do you actually provide feedback on that conversation you just had in a meaningful way that's been mapped back to what you need from them and then we say ah i like the person they like the red Sox. i love the red Sox. i'm from boston yeah. hire them <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that you know the Red Sox are not the best uh, judgment call, at least in my <laughs> mind. If you're going to hire someone for a business, if they like a certain sports team, I, that just my thoughts on it. But it actually goes into the uh, that's personal growth, right? That, that's how you actually build personal growth. Is the same way you have to start looking at your life critically, and then when I mean, what's the excuse for people working out all the time? Right? I don't have time. I have this and I have this and I have this and I have that and blah, 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 blah. You have to make time in order to do anything. You have to make time and fit it into something else. And if you're going to just try and jam it between two other things, you're not going to get the, the, what the rest of what it is you, uh, the end result that you want, right? Because it's a side note. It's a, you're not putting any effort into it. It's just being thrown in between something. Um, 
yeah, it it's a very challenging personal growth and business and high, like so many things actually play into each other that since I've started the podcast, I have learned it's all basically the same concept, right? Put some time and effort and thought into it. And usually you can come out ahead. It, uh, it's one of those things. Um, so I was going to ask about your transition, uh, but I think we covered it pretty well. The one thing I ask everybody though, is if you could go back to say February, 2016, and talk to yourself and give you one <laughs> one piece of advice and be like, how am I going to make this transition a little bit better? What do you think you would say? That's a uh, that's a good question. Now I'm looking for <laughs> now I'm looking for filler words to to think about that. There's a, there's a lot I would say. Um, I mean, look, I've been pretty open about it. You know, I mean, I I got out of the military and I had my whole life that I had known as an adult was spent uh, generally at war. Mm -hmm. um, I went, I graduated Boston University in, in May of 2003. In October, I went to basic training. It was, you know, what, two years into Afghanistan. It was uh, six six months or so, you know, uh, into Iraq. And uh, and everything was on, on, on a war footing. And I didn't have a, I didn't have a 20s. Uh, I went in, I yeah. was, you know, 20. 23 years old. Um, I went to an infantry unit uh, for my first year. I was an infantry platoon leader. I went to Iraq or first you know, two years. I, I went to Iraq for a year during that mm -hmm. time. Um, came back. I went to special forces and I, I spent uh, the better part of, uh, of my entire time deployed uh, multiple, a couple more times to Iraq, all over Europe. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Africa and uh I got out and it was very much freedom yeah. in a way. Uh, oh my God, I'm in New York and uh, this is wild. And you can, I can, you can do whatever you want now um, at the, at the, the sacrifice of a lot of things, you know, the sacrifice of my family, the sacrifice of, you know, building a relationship with my daughter of, uh, almost, you know, permanently destroying the relationship with my wife. Uh, and if I could go back to February of 2016, it would have been, it would have said, pump the brakes. Uh, you don't need to make up for uh, 13 years uh, in, in, right now in the next 18 months. Uh, and uh, you didn't, you missed a lot, but you didn't miss that much and yeah. you've had a perspective that you take now because of the experiences that you had, that is valuable. That is worth something. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't need to compromise your values and you don't need to compromise uh, who you are and who you want to be because you feel some need to live in, live in New York and, and act like you're, 24, 25 years old, uh, yeah. when you're 35 years old and you have responsibilities and a life and people count on you and rely on yeah. you. Uh, that's what I would go back and tell myself. That, that is a, that's an outstanding point. And I've heard it from many, many people. Uh, just take the time, just take the time. Like you have the time. There's no need to rush. There's no need to freak out. There's always this, I, I know a lot of vets, uh, that as soon as they got out, they're just like, I gotta get, I gotta get a job. I have to have this. I gotta be working again. I gotta be low. And you oh, just I had like a week Whoa. off, and I was pissed. Like, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I did. I I started on. A, I got out on a on a Friday, mm -hmm. and I had to wait a because there was like I had a plan to start on Monday. I had I had basically gotten out, and then like that next morning, I was driving to the East coast from Colorado Springs. I was driving to New York yep. and I, and then that week, that last week I, they had said, Oh, well, something happened with like your onboarding and the paperwork and we have to wait a week. So some pay payment cycle or something, I don't remember. And, and I was pissed. I was like, what yeah. do you mean I have to wait a week? Like, this is bullshit. I needed to, start, I, you know, I was planning to start on Monday. That was the day we agreed upon, you know, and they're like, nah, it's not a big deal. You know, and it's like, you look back on it and it's like, yeah, it's like a week, whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, but back then that was like the biggest deal. I mean, this, the, I was so mad. Uh, and that whole week, it's like, well, what am I going to do with myself? 
you know, like this is crazy. I have nothing to do. It's like the first time in you know, in an entire career where you're like, I have yeah. nothing to do this week. Yeah. Right. Oh. And then you go, you go in on Monday morning and then you look back on it and it's like, okay, so a week was nothing. You yeah. needed like, you needed like a couple of months off. Yeah. At least, at least I, uh, I came up with this idea with a couple of buddies of mine that they, the military needs something like an out camp. Like we have a boot camp to get in, right? You need an out camp where yeah. you just, uh, with its own little, we, we have a thing called the PAP platoon. So you're personnel awaiting training. So if you don't have a course right away, then you just kind of sit in a holding, right? And uh, you need something like that. Okay, I'm getting out. You're going to get out uh, as of the end date X, whatever, two or three months ahead of time. You just sit down. Okay, this is how you do your taxes. This is how you find a doctor. <laughs> like the the real basics of basics of how to live a normal human life outside of the military. Well, and, the U.S. Uh, started... So the army has uh, what's called, or the DOD now has what's called the DOD skill bridge program. And the, the skill bridge program, it's been, it's been around for a while, but it hasn't become, it, it's only in the last couple of years become very popular. And that's like a six month program. It's an internship oh. program where uh, organizations can apply to become a, a skill bridge partner. And you have a number you know, they set a number of roles that you can have in your company and transitioning veterans can come and they can come work at your company for up to six months. The military is paying them. So you don't yep. have to pay them as the employee, as the employer. And that person is working at your company and that's, that's their job for that last six months or so that they're in the army. And that's creating a very valuable experience mm -hmm. for people for, for two reasons, both on both sides of that equation. Number one, veterans to uh, start to step away and understand what's life going to be like. What do mm -hmm. I want to do? Here's an opportunity to do something. Maybe I love it. Maybe I don't, but at least it's a different you know, yeah. tool for the toolbox, right? You yeah, know, where, exactly. where you say like, you know, okay, I had that experience and, and good, bad or whatever. But then also on the other side, you have an opportunity as the employer to evaluate people and evaluate yeah. talent. And then yep. determine is this somebody that I can bring into my organization and give and create a you know, cr create a long term relationship with them and bring them in. So I, I think it's a great program. That's a fantastic program. I'd love to have something like that here up here in Canada. But uh, our government is not um, the, at the greatest it's ever been in, <laughs> in our history. But uh, we'll leave the politics out of this one. Um, it actually, you know, it actually leads into exactly what we want to talk about today, which was laying foundations and what a program like that does is it lays a foundation of there's a world outside of the military, right? And unfortunately, when you get in a lot of times that becomes your life, which rightly so, right? If the, the military is a high stakes, high reward kind of lifestyle, right? And if you put your all into it, it it'll, uh, it'll be a very, very interesting time in your life for, to say the least. Uh, but when you when you step out into the world, the world doesn't work the same way. Just like we were talking about earlier, right? <laughs> yeah, the drive and the requirement to constantly be working is just not the same outside as it is in. And one of the first things I had to do was break my habits of, you know, military life of my knife hand. That's still nice and sharp, man. But <laughs> <laughs> especially with the kids. Oh, yes. Unfortunately, there was a couple days when I first got out. I was a master corporal uh, and I was an instructor right before I left, before I retired. So that knife hand was just like, <laughs> and came out like super fast. Uh, and I had a five month old son who doesn't respond well to knife handing. Surprise, surprise. Um, but what do you do when you need to break habits? What are your what are your tools to actually break those bad habits down? Yeah, I mean, I so we just we just did on 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 the podcast. We just did a an episode with uh, Dr. Laura Watkins. So it was episode uh, fifty seven was mm -hmm. with Dr. Laura Watkins, and and, her, and she she talks about habits. Uh, and habits are habits come from what are called hidden drivers. And that's the hidden drivers of behavior, right? So you have this escalating pattern. You have hidden, you have hidden drivers, which are kind of like, you know, your core, like attributes, Rich Divinity would call them attributes, right? But what are these hidden drivers of behavior that then in, in certain situations and moments force you to take action one way or another, respond and, and 
or, or react. Mm -hmm. And then those actions are what begin to form the foundations of behaviors. And so behave, behaviors and, and habits are developed over time. Uh, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, Andy Frazella. Mm -hmm. and, and everyone knows if a lot of people know, very, very famous. I aspire to have his audience one day, but <laughs> Andy, Andy Frazella, so, somewhat of a polarizing figure, but Andy will, Andy had, I listened to a podcast of his one day and he said, listen, you didn't get fat in a day. So you're not going to get skinny in a day. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that that's a simple statement. But wrapped in that simple statement is an entire context of behaviors and habits, which then comes back to choices and decisions. Mm -hmm. I talk a lot in my work on professional and personal development and building organizations about choice mm -hmm. and that we make choices. Okay. So performance is a choice. Uh, um, Kristen Holmes is the VP of performance science at whoop. I had her on, on my podcast and, uh, several months ago and, and sh her phrase is performance is a choice. And I've added since then, I've told her this, that I, I've added that, you know, that performance is a choice, but your choices also affect your performance. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so what does that mean? Right. It means that I can choose to perform, but everything that I then choose in my life, will affect my performance. Do I sleep at night? Do I eat well? Do I go, do I, do I drink too much? Do I choose to work out? But all those choices are a byproduct of the habits that we developed through our behaviors and these hidden drivers that tie back into Laura Watkins. Right. And so yeah. I, I learned so much from talking to all these people on my podcast and I, like, I start weaving them all together <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, Oh my God. And then people are like, Whoa, how did you know that? And I'm like, I don't know. I just took these people ideas and I like, put them together, <laughs> but these people are brilliant. I'm just like regurgitating mm -hmm. their stuff. But, but really, I mean, that's what it comes down to is that you can, you can affect your habit if you understand that you have the autonomy to choose your behavior and to choose and that your behavior is a result of the choices that you make. Right. Mm -hmm. And so back to my initial point, you didn't get fat in a day. You're not going to get skinny in a day. Okay. So every day when I go in there and this is the conversation I have with Laura, I, I said, well, I don't want to eat pizza for lunch. I don't want to eat leftover pizza for lunch but I can't stop myself because I love pizza and it's just so good. And then there's like a financial decision behind this because like I bought the pizza and now I don't want to throw it away. And it's like, and her point was, okay, well, when you ordered the pizza, why did you order the large pizza? Order the medium pizza. And then at dinner, you'll finish the pizza or there will be some leftover that you won't financially feel that you're, that you're wasteful yeah. when you're throwing it away. So these decisions that you're making that are leading you to now open the fridge at lunch and say, Oh, I'm in between meetings. I don't, you know, Oh, I, I don't want the protein shake yeah. before we came on. I did. I mean, I did this right now and, and, and the, the, before we came <laughs> on, it was, it was 12 58 and I was yeah. standing in the, in the kitchen and I was looking at the protein shake and the blueberries and I was looking at the cookies, right? And I thought about the pizza conversation Yeah. and I said, okay, don't make the protein shake, have the blueberries, right? But her whole point is every decision that you make is going to compound into some second and third order effect. And she is right. There's an exercise she does called the iceberg. And we did mm -hmm. a graphic on it. And if you go look at our Instagram and on our webpage you'll, for her episode, you'll see it. And you have to now start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I order the pizza, order the medium pizza. And then you're never in this situation the next day to have yep. to have these bad habits that, and then what, you know, cause why, why don't I want to eat the pizza? Well, I don't want to eat the pizza because I want to work out later, but yep. now I'm going to feel like crap because I ate the pizza and now I don't want to work out. Plus I've been up since 4am sitting at this desk doing a variety of different things. And now I'm kind of tired, but I had the pizza and now I don't feel good. Yeah. So now what happens tonight? Well, I ate the pizza for dinner. I ate the pizza for lunch. I didn't work out. I've been up since 4 a.m. I'm going to work until 10 p.m. tonight. I'm going to do it all over again. And to Andy Frizzela's point, a year later, 
Now it's that. <laughs> yep. Yep. But how do you reverse it? You have to unwind all of those decisions back to the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the real trick is that it just keeps going. Right. Because if you, you know, the, uh, the choices that you make as an adult now are based on the habits that you learned as a teenager. And those habits are based off of the habits that you learned as a child. And like, how far back do you want to go to a point where you can go, wait a second. I need, okay. The changes are made or the change, the habits have been built up to this point. Now we need to break them. And it's, you know, when you're laying foundations, physical foundations, right? You're going to, you have to clear the area first. You can't just start building foundations on a bunch of grass. It's not going to do well for you. right? You actually have to break ground, scrape back a layer of, uh, of topsoil, whatever it is you need and create a baseline, right? You have to get to a point where you go, okay, this is where I'm at now. And that takes a lot of really critical, uh, you have to really look at yourself critically because when I got out of the military, I was like, PT, (laughs) who needs that (laughs) shaving? No. Uh, and that happens to a lot of us, right? We, uh, we get out and we add some pounds because we're not, we're not constantly doing PT every morning. We're not always in the field working to a point that you're uh, in a caloric deficit regularly. Right. Um, And man, it is so hard to build that baseline. Like how do you get to a point where you can look at yourself critically enough and say, okay, where am I now? Well, a lot of times it's, it's not how much pain do you, how much, how painful do you want to make it? You know, Mm -hmm. that's what it comes down to. Right. Uh, if you, you think about another guy, um, Hunter McIntyre, we, we released an episode with Hunter McIntyre today. He won the go ruck games down at mm-hmm. Sandlot Jackson, Jacksonville. And, and we had a chance to interview him after, and he's like six time obstacle course racing champion, holds multiple <laughs> world records. I mean, the guy's like, dude, I, 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 he's like the most fittest, fittest guy I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, incredible, but he, in the interview I did with him, he tells me this story about how he was he was addicted to heroin wow right in his 20s <laughs> wow and he was finding himself and he tells a story about being in miami doing you know eight balls of cocaine and then trying to go compete and getting like you know third fourth fifth sixth and realizing that the only difference between him being a champion and winning and him being okay was the fact that he was addicted to drugs. And so he had to have this loss. He had to go through this personal journey to hit the bottom to truly understand that, like, if I want to be great, this is the behavior shift that I have to have. And then he talks about how he just went cold turkey on it, woke up one day, which you know, it takes an incredible amount of self-discipline. I mean, you, you know, you were talking a bit ago, you know, wake, wake, I think before we started, you were saying, you know, wake up, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to, you know, eat perfectly work out. I'm going to sleep, you know, eight and a half hours. I'm going to get all my work done. Right. Yeah. And the reality is, is like, if you could do one of those things, you're on a good path. Yeah. That is, uh, that's unbelievable. I can't even imagine trying to drop some, Oh man, that, that <laughs> the, the amount of withdrawal, that you have yeah. to go through. I mean, the the fitness of he would have to have already to be competing at that level would help, but bleh, I, I don't even want to think about the amount of withdrawal you'd have to go through after. Well, I mean, I mean, Google the guy. Look, go look at our episode. You're just like, you're like, whoa. <laughs> I will absolutely do that. Oh my goodness. Um, I guess really, it really comes down to, and I was talking to a few buddies about this too. Is that it? What do you want? Right. What What is it that you actually want because once you figure that out nothing's going to stop you right i i I have a picture of myself when i was i think i was four and i was wearing a green olive drab sweater with army stenciled across the front like i i I wanted to be in the army since i was little nothing was going to stop me uh and then i became a bit of a pothead in high school and that that decision started to slip away right and like you said earlier it's just the those little decisions that make the future you it your your future kind of wavers based on those decisions and then um i talked to my brother at one point he was just like he was in south korea teaching english 
and it, so we were doing this uh, long distance phone call, but he's like, aren't you going to, weren't you going to join the army? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I still could. I don't know. Maybe blah, blah, blah. And he was like, no, just fucking do it. I was like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I guess I could just do that. Right. And I, next morning I went down to the uh, recruiter's office and started my paperwork and started going through that whole thing. There was a whole nother whole rigmarole that I didn't get out for, get in for another year and a half, but that's beside the point. But you know, figuring out what you want is, it's challenging. It takes time and effort. And as we were talking earlier in the, uh, with the, the recruiting, you have to know what you want at a bare minimum. <laughs> Do you have any, uh, any tips, any tricks to figure that out or <laughs> is it just figure... <laughs> figure out what you want? Or is this just a, uh, everyone's kind of screwed, figure it out on your own. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, I'm reminded of Travis Holman uh, from a conversation I had. I, I don't know, maybe it was episode 43, or, I think. And Travis Holman is the CEO of Holman Lockers. They make the locker rooms for all the professional sports teams. Oh. Like the thick locker rooms. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, everyone is wired for exactly what they want to do. Uh, your job is to figure out, is figure out what it is. Um, and some people are better at that than others. Uh, I don't know. I don't think there's a secret formula to finding, I would call it purpose, mm -hmm. right? To finding your purpose, but, but purpose matters. It, it matters in everything that we do. Think about a company, think about uh, the military, military operation. Where do you start? You know, you start, what's the mission, right? What's mm -hmm. the end state? It doesn't even start with the mission. It starts with the end state. What do I need to achieve? And then once you understand what you need to achieve, well, now you can craft, you know, this mission, these key tasks, you know, all these other mm -hmm. kind of commanders at 10, everything that you need to get there. But it starts with the end state. What is the purpose of why I'm here? What am I going to, what gets me up every day? And in the absence of a clear road, direction, guidance, what is going to allow and drive me to take the next step? And it comes down to defining your purpose. What are you trying to do? And that's normally pretty broad, right? It can be, it can be somewhat tactical in nature, right? I want to win a race. Mm -hmm. um, I want to win a championship. You know, I want to, I want to be the best podcaster, you know, ever, you know, which, which I often tell myself. Um, yeah. But, and then I'm slapped back into reality uh, <laughs> by, 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 by Joe, Joe Rogan and Tim Ferriss yeah, and Shane exactly. Walsh say, get, get back down there. Yeah. Guy we've never heard of. <laughs> um, but, but that's gotta, but you gotta understand the purpose, you know, what's driving you. Right. I mean, and that takes what we call in our nine characteristics of performance that are defined by special operations, it takes some level of uh, effective intelligence mm -hmm. and effective intelligence is this bank of knowledge and experiences that have been built over time. And because you've experienced these events, these things, these situations in your life, as you're faced with similar or the same situations later on in life, you start to understand how do I respond? How does it feel? It becomes less of a science and more of an art. Mm -hmm. to understand that, well, I may not have been in this exact situation, but I generally understand now how I would re react in a similar situation. Now I can start to shape my decision-making around that. I tie that a lot to purpose because nobody wakes, you know, my son's two years old. He doesn't wake up every day and say, well, dad, you know, dad, dad, my you know, purpose in life is, you know, this, right. You know, and, and I think a lot of us, it's struggle. We struggle over time, especially coming yeah. out of the military. Cause you know, you, you had a purpose. It was all, you know, and now you have to go figure it out. Um, and, and that can change too. You know, and I think that I, I would argue to your answer, your question, maybe more succinctly, I would argue the alternative that it's not necessarily about waking up and identifying exactly, you know, this is, this is the trick or the tool that you need to do this. It's, it's more about not being scared to fail in a number of different things mm -hmm. that will eventually help you to figure out 
who you want to be and where you want to go. And I would say that what happens too often is we put what's called these limiting beliefs. Colin Bevan talks about limiting beliefs Mm -hmm. where there are these mindsets that we put into our own heads, whether they're, you know, based on society or other people or our own uh, belief or understanding of our physical or mental capabilities that say that I can't do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, why can't you do that? And what if you tried and what if it doesn't work? Okay. If it doesn't work and you try it, where are you then at the end of it versus where are you now? Because if you never do it, you never know. And if you do do it and it works, then great. If you do it and it doesn't work, well, at least now you know it didn't work. Right. But we put it in our head that we can't do certain things. Yeah. And then we can't forward our path to understand who we are, what's our purpose, where do we want to be, what does it look like? That is a that's a great point. You know, I'm I'm currently selling my house, and I, we're looking at buying a new house. And I uh, people are like, "Oh, have you gone house shopping? Have you gone to all these things?" And I I was like, "You know, we're not there yet, but the one benefit we have is we we know what we don't want." And I think that's the I think that's what you're getting yeah. at is that like you have to know what you don't want to do before you could realize what you actually like because it, you know in life in work in uh everything it's more along the lines of try it and see what happens and i the advice i give to a lot of vets uh regularly is you know if you've ever wanted to try something go for it <laughs> just, just try it. you like you know you've never been rock climbing before cool go to a gym try it out you want to uh i don't know do friggin' pole dancing cool there's lots of gyms that do that now (laughs) you know it it's it's more about just trying shit until you know your own stuff with the wall until it sticks and go hey that that sounds pretty good but just because you figure out what you want to do doesn't mean that it's easy oh for sure you know and and that's the next part of this thing is right okay well i generally know what i want to do now okay great i know what motivates me i know my purpose well now you have to go do it right that's the that now it's hard yeah. Now it's hard, right? I talk about this when I work with athletes all the time. You know, getting, putting the work in to get to the start of the race, that's great. Mm-hmm. You earn the right to sit at the at the start of the race course, but the work has actually not, not started, right? The work is going to start now mm-hmm. because everybody has put the same level of effort and energy in now to get to that moment where execution matters. And it was a lot of hard work, but now you have to go do it. Now you have to perform. Now you actually have to execute. So if you think that you got to the start of the race or the start of the game, or, you know, you can tie it back to a, a presentation to your executive team or your team or, or whatever, an initiative at work. You know, if you, if you're not an athlete, you actually got to do it. Right? Like just getting there is one thing, but now what's going to happen when I'm in the moment when it's all about execution? Mm-hmm. Cause that's what you've actually prepared for. And when yeah. what you see the difference between like champions and people who are just out there is that they understand that the actual moment of performance starts when the competition begins. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, we see this in the military all the time, right? It's the people between, it's the difference between an innovator and the good idea fairy, right? Yeah. Lots of people have got great ideas. Sure. Oh, yeah. Everybody has great ideas. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. I have, a, mil- I have that. a million ideas a day. Right. But it's the, it's the people that actually put the work in that become, uh, they're the ones that's that step off the ledge they're the ones that actually are sitting there with the oar in hand ready to row in the moment uh that actually change things as you say they become champions they become leadership they become ceos they become you know uh pinnacles to follow but it is a uh it's very challenging and i know for one of the things that i i struggle with regularly is setting goals that's one of my my biggest issues i have been for many years, I've been the jack of all trades. I'm able to pick stuff up really fast. I'm able to learn it really quickly, and I'm able to 
worked at it at a manageable level for most things across the board. Unfortunately, what that's enabled me to do or what the habit that it's built is that now I, I just do, I don't, I don't set the goal down the, down the range and say, okay, that's where I want to go. I just go, okay, well, I'll just walk in that general direction and then I'll be good. <laughs> right? I'll figure it out on the way. So how do we, how do we, I mean, I remember learning in school, the smart goals and all this other stuff, but where, where's the line between achievable, actual goals and saying, I want to be an astronaut, right? You know what I mean? Like you could be, uh, out to lunch completely. We're just going to shoot for the stars, which is always beneficial. But how do you break those down into the smaller points that you actually have to achieve to get, you know, I have to join the air force. I have to become a pilot. I have to become a blah, blah, blah. I have to get my degree in certain sciences before I can join the astronaut program. Then I got to select it for NASA, like break it down to the smaller points. How do you do that? Uh, well, what I'll tell you is hope is not a course of action. Uh, <laughs> Right. Like that's, that's, that's where I would start, uh, is that you just, you, 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 nobody's, nobody's coming to you and saying, you know, Hey man, you know, saw you in the grocery store. You look like a great, you look like a great astronaut, right? You know, you should come, you should come join us. Um, so hope is not a course of action. Uh, so you got to come back to that, that purpose, right? Start with that purpose. And then, and then you got to have a plan, you know, like our, my tagline, how you prepare today determines success tomorrow. You know, I truly believe that. I mean, think about anything you did in the military. Think about every time you were sent to a new job, every time you were sent to, you were promoted. What does the military do? They take you, they put you in a training program. They teach you some basic fundamental stuff. They test you on it. And then they say, okay, now go out and do. Mm -hmm. Right. They never take you and they just say, oh, go do. Figure it out. <laughs> right. Because yeah. you won't succeed. Yeah. So the level of preparation that goes into anything that you do in the military as an athlete, in your bit in business, the educate, the time you put creating knowledge and creating a knowledge base for yourself understanding that the, your team members, you know, which is often lost. Well, I'm a great leader. Okay, cool. You know, if you said you're a great leader, you're probably not. Mm -hmm. let's, let's start there because you lack humility. Okay. Yeah. But how well do you, you know, how much do you invest in time in understanding your team and understanding your craft and truly understanding, you know, what it is. All of these things come back to preparation. Now we still got to act. But that's what sets the foundation. That's mm -hmm. what sets you off on a path where you're not in the course of action of hopefully. You're not winging it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, people will tell you, people do it all the time. Uh, I, 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 I wing it. I figure it out. And there are some very successful people who have done that. Yep. But there's a difference between those people. You, anyone can get lucky one time. Right. And again, if you think that it's just a matter of, well, I'll wing it and it will work. Maybe it will. Don't get me wrong. I, I hope it does. I mean, I <laughs> wish it would happen to me. It never has. <laughs> but, but you've got to, but the percentage likelihood of that actually happening to you is slim to none. Yeah. And so do you want to spend your whole life hoping that a miracle is going to occur and you're going to get everything you ever dreamed of? hand it to you or are you going to go on and take concrete steps every day to get yourself there mm -hmm. to make it happen yeah that's the decision that you have to make and that's the that's comes back to the you know you choose to perform yeah it's uh i just i just had a thought there and i lost it but <laughs> side the point the i think the real challenge is is being critical without judgment Right. To, to be able to look at yourself and say, I want X, so I need to do Y. But to, to remove the judgment of the, oh, I haven't done it before, or I can't do it now, or this isn't, this will never work, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, I, I, I was very judgmental of my own abilities once I got out of the military because I was looking at it like, oh, you know, I, I, I can handle high explosives really well. 
how am I going to turn that into a job? Well, actually, there's quite a few jobs that <laughs> require your use of handling of high explosives. But it's very easy to uh, detract from your own skills if you're afraid of the work that it's going to take to get there. And I think that a lot of it comes back down to fear um, and that comfort zone of this is what I know. This is what I, I, I've always known this. This is what I do. I just don't want to, you know, go outside of that because then it's unknown and anything can happen. It's a, uh, it's a very challenging mindset to get out of. But once you do, oh, this is what I was going to say earlier, was that it gives you not just purpose, but fulfillment, right? Once you find your purpose, that's great. You can go after it and you can do these things. But it's always better to work for it and, and achieve it than it is to just have it handed to you. So, you know, you were saying earlier, if you get lucky, that's great. But you didn't really earn it. And uh, um, my boys look at my, you know, I have a little coin collection and a patch collection and stuff like that. And they're like, ooh, how did you get that one? And I was like, I earned it. Ooh, how did you get that one? I earned that one too, right? It's that level of fulfillment you get from actually attaining it through the work, I think is an important thing. Uh, and it's an important piece to, to achieve because at least in my mind, that's how you build further habits, right? When you've earned a certain point and you're like, fuck, that was awesome. That feels great. Let's do it again. <laughs> well, let, let me, let me offer you this, uh, well, vignette, I guess, <laughs> if you will, uh, I was having a conversation last week with one of the senior leaders at, at my company, and mm -hmm. he said, "We're we're we're discussing and we're implementing a leadership training program that I'm that I'm running and building for all of the there's about thirty there's about thirty thirty five people on the leadership team, and so we're going to implement this over the course of the next four to six weeks." and And he said, "You know that the more senior you are, the older you are, the more the more important it is to be." Uh, to be accepting of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. But the older and more experienced you are, the less willing you are to seek other perspectives. Right? Think about mm -hmm. that for a second. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because you're set in your ways. Yep. You Now you, this is where things like effective intelligence can become arrogance. Yep. Right? Confidence becomes arrogance. When the reality is, is as you get older, you have to be more open-minded. Now I'll take that example and go and think about my daughter in the last three days. She's, she's in her second year of playing lacrosse. We moved to an area of the country where these people are wild about youth lacrosse. Like I've yeah. never, I've never seen, I've seen, I've worked with college and professional athletes who are not as intense as they are at youth lacrosse here. Uh, and she's starting to figure out, like, if I want to be at this next level, there are certain things that I'm going to have to do. And I'm going to have to put the work in, and there are things that I don't know, and I have to accept that. And so we got a treadmill yesterday. And I had to wait to use the treadmill because she has identified that she needs to work on her running. Mm -hmm. It's 12 years old. And now taking it upon herself to say, well, I can get on this treadmill and I can start to work on these things to become better if I want to compete. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the mind of a child. But that's the mindset when it comes to development that actually you need when you're 30, 40, 50, 60. Mm -hmm. Because that's how you continuously iterate and continuously grow yourself, your teams, your organizations that willingness to actually be susceptible to a different perspective and doing something differently than what you're doing right now to achieve success. Mm -hmm. It is uh, it's a mindset that is very difficult to get into once you're out of it, right? Like once you, you, you know, you look back, I, I look back on the, you know, the eighties and nineties and the two thousands and the, uh, the mindset of, my peer group at the time was whatever, right? Let's go party. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. Let's go do these. Other, like there wasn't a lot of go getters back in the nineties in high school, right? There were some, don't get me wrong, but they were still nerds and they were still geeks. And then it was the, 
uh, the culture hadn't shifted to where it is now, where you have a much more collective desire to be better, at least where I was. <clears throat> and uh, I, I look back at the people that I used to hang out with and I'm like, man, why the hell did I hang out with these people? <laughs> but it was easy at the time because they were, they were in the same social circle. They were in the same, uh, the same group. And it was the, it was the choice, the one choice that I made that said, you know what? I want to, I'm going to join the army. I want to be different. I want to do something more. I want to do something larger that put me on the, the pathway to where I am now. And as we were talking at the beginning of this whole podcast was like, it really comes down to the choice, the one <laughs> choice to just begin and then see where it takes you because <laughs> who knows, right? If you, uh, I know lots of guys that, you know, they want to join the army and they got through, they got through the training. They realized the moment they got to the unit, they're like, this is not for me. I don't want to be here. Cool. Good on you. Yeah. Oh, they went on to something else, right? And they they look back on the experience and they're like, man, that that focal or focused what I wanted because it was something that I realized I didn't want that, which was the large chunk. And um, for myself, I realized that I wanted to help people when I got out. That was my big one. I just, I just want to help people. So I thought, you know, well, how am I going to do that? Well, I like horses, so maybe I should start a ranch and have people out and we can do equine therapy and this is going to be great and all these things. So I started down that path I realized that that was not the path that I wanted to be on and I go, okay, cool. But I still want to help people. So how am I going to do that? And I, you know, start getting into other, uh, into the veterans advocacy and helping people out where I can and et cetera, et cetera. But had I not at the very beginning gone horses, cool, let's, started off right and made that decision to just say okay cool and then you build from there it's just uh, it's such a great point that <laughs> it just comes back down to choice it comes back down to choice i love it um so brother first off this has been an amazing conversation i just want to thank you so much <laughs> thank you. i've had a blast for having me. um are there any final points on laying foundations that we haven't hit that you wanted to get across well, I ask, so I, this is why I, I like what you're doing here. Uh, so I ask every one of my guests the same oh. question. I, I, I ask them in the context of the, the Jedbergs, who I say had to do three things every day as core foundational tasks to be successful. They had to be able to shoot. They had to be able to move. They had to be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. And if they did these three things with the utmost precision, then they could focus their attention on more complex challenges that came their way. And then I ask, what are the three things that you do as the foundations for your success every day? Uh, and so I ask everybody that question and I would pose that question to anybody listening. Mm -hmm. If you can just take a second and think about it and say, what are those things? Is it working out? Is it eating right? Is it making a list? Is mm -hmm. it communicating? You know, is it meditation? It can be anything. It can make your bed, right? Are you deliberate about those three things? And everything else that you do in your life builds upon those foundations. Then I think you can put yourself on the path to where you want to be, identify your purpose, and work to achieve it. That is a that is a really really good question. <laughs> that, that again, introspection without judgment. You have to be able to look at yourself critically to, to develop those, man, that is a, those are good ones. Um, if anybody wants to find you, follow you with all that stuff on social media, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, they can follow me, uh, Fran Richopi. Uh, I'm uh, Richopi Fran on Instagram, Francis Richopi on Twitter. So you have this name and you'd be surprised that other people <laughs> like actually have different variations of it. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, but Fran Richopi on LinkedIn, or you can go to the easier one is to go to the Jedberg podcast and just go to at Jedberg podcast on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn. Uh, they all link back to me. So that's the best place to go or jedbergpodcast.com. Wicked. We'll make sure all of those are in the uh, show notes. So if anybody awesome. needs to find you directly, they can. Um, but I, again, I can't, I can't thank you enough. This has been a, just a fantastic conversation, but before we go, um, 
I don't think I actually got you to to, to describe the podcast itself. Uh, like, <laughs> what what's your what's your uh, yeah the the plan? The whole what's the concept behind it? What is it that uh, in case nobody's heard of it? Sure. What like what what's it all about? The, uh, the so my podcast is called the Jedberg Podcast. Um, it is. T- what I call it is conversations with visionaries, transformative leaders, those dedicated to winning, no matter the challenge, mm-hmm. what the Jedberg organization was, was an organization um, built by the allies in world war two in May of 1943. The allies had identified that the war was effectively lost. Uh, Germany had taken over and occupied France. They had superior mm-hmm. machine guns. They were in trans positions. They were bombing London. And, uh, and the Allies said the only way to defeat the Germans was to invade France. The only way to invade France was Operation Overlord through Normandy, but that was sure, sure defeat. Uh, so they needed to create an organization that could conduct sabotage and subversion operations against the Germans to not allow them to reinforce the beaches on Normandy. Mm-hmm. So they created Operation Jedburg. They create they recruited one hundred each from the British, French and American militaries. They brought them to Jedburg, Scotland, and they trained them in three-man teams, one American, one Brit, one French. And starting the night before D-Day, they parachuted in three-man teams behind enemy lines in occupied France. They linked up with the French resistance forces. They they trained them, they armed them, and they conducted these sabotage and subversion operations against the Germans, which allowed for the beachhead to occur in Normandy. And for the subsequent weeks, they continued to disrupt the Germans' ability to reinforce the beach, which allowed us to uh, to take France back uh, yeah. and get and get a foothold there. That organization went on to become part of it was it was worked with the OSS and then it went yeah. to form the Operations Directorate of the CIA after the war, mm-hmm. and then subsequently in the early fifties, that action arm was taken into the U S army and commissioned as U S army special forces, the green berets. Mm-hmm. And so my lineage goes back to the Jedbergs of world war two. And, uh, now I tell the story of modern day Jedbergs who are in business, athletics, social activism, journalism, uh, you name it, we're telling their story. And, uh, our goal is impact. And how do we tell their story to better others? who will take an interest in what we're talking about. That is, that is outstanding. The, uh, <clears throat> it, it's actually kind of mind blowing how we can take the lineage from organizations like that and just, and work them down to, uh, you know, the original, the original decision going, Oh man, we need something to do X. Okay, cool. Like I, we look at here in Canada, the big one is the first special service force. Mm-hmm. We're always very like, yeah, we were awesome back then. Yeah. Um, and now US our, and Canada. Yeah. And now the CSOR, the Canadian Special Operations Regiment, um, they trace their lineage back then. They they still wear the arrowhead. They carry around tomahawks. They're they think they're cool guys, you know, all that good stuff. <laughs> but it it's it's fantastic. I, I love the fact that the you you've made the connection between something so um it was almost an impossible feat, right? It to take France from Germany at that time in 1943 was looked at as just impossible. We're just not going to do it. That's why they tried to go through Italy, and then they got hauled up there. And then like, oh god, now we got to go. So to take something that a decision made saying, okay, this is impossible, but we're going to try anyway. But How what we if it? we can? What if we can? That's a great line. Yeah, that is a hundred percent it. Um, yeah. Again, I, I'm. I've already subscribed to it, so I'm going to be listening to it more. <laughs> well, <thanks. laughs> I, I, I've I've been subscribed to it for a while. I just I haven't really. Uh, I, ha- I have so many podcasts in my list of like. It's like you know you get a reading list and you're like oh I got like eight books. It's a competitive it. market. It really is. It's uh it's fantastic. But again, brother, it has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I, will we'll have to get you on again. I have another one called the Shoot Dog Round Table that right. uh, I'll have to get you involved in, and it's uh. It's a broader conversation, but we'll talk All about right. that later. Thanks, brother. All right. Thanks so much. That concludes another episode of The Toolbox. I really appreciate you all listening. It has been my absolute pleasure bringing you this guest. If you enjoyed what you heard, please like, share, subscribe, do all that other wicked stuff. It uh, helps me keep the lights on. To all those out there putting it on the line every day, I just want to let you know that I appreciate you. 
military, veterans, first responders, civil servants, you name it, keep this place running, and I really do appreciate it. So thank you. Don't forget, stay open, stay humble, stay focused, with grace, not slack. Shimo. Shimo.